beginning of our final section, section three. The end of the Cratchit's dinner. At last the dinner was all done. The cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half of one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass. Two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done. And Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed. A merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge, or no kind spirit say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Penitence is when you admit to wrongdoing in your heart and your soul. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, this is his, his kind of criticism and telling off, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr Scrooge. You know who he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and, mer and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care twopence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. It wasn't um, sent away. After it had passed away, they were ten minutes merrier than before from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. This is hardly anything. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, 
who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow, from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. This is someone who buys things from you for usually a lot less than they're worth and then sells them on. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. <laughs>